judge has ruled uh, that the alleged Oxford High School shooter's parents, James and Jennifer Crumbly, will stand trial for involuntary manslaughter. Uh, prosecutors were in court today continuing to present evidence uh, against the couple. Authorities were arguing the pair should stand trial in connection to the deadly school shooting that killed four teenagers on November the 30th. Just last year, a judge did grant that and ruled uh, in favor of the prosecution. Uh, prosecutors are accusing both of failing to act when their son Ethan showed mental distress and created disturbing drawings before he opened fire on classmates at his high school, killing four of them, injuring several others. Let's see some of this play out in court today. You're going to see witness testimony from a school counselor at Oxford High School. Testimony, you're going to give me the truth under the penalty of perjury. Absolutely, I do. Um, if you please have a seat, I'm going to ask you to state and spell both your first and last name for the court report, please. Would you like me to take my mask off? If you feel comfortable, you can take your mask off. Uh, my name is Sean Hopkins, S H A W N H O P K I N S. Um, you'll notice that there's a few microphones sitting there. I'm going to uh, ask you to make sure you keep your voice up and that you speak loudly and clearly because we are in addition to amplifying your voice, we are required to record all court proceedings. Um, you will be required to respond verbally to any question, shake of the head, or uh-huh, or uh-huh, or not acceptable, okay? Understood. Okay, thank you. If you can, if you could just scoot up a little bit closer to those mics. May I proceed? Good afternoon, Mr. Hopkins. Good afternoon. If I ask you a question you don't understand, just let me know, or if you'd like me to repeat it, just let me know. Okay. Okay. Can you tell the court what your occupation is? I am a counselor. And where do you work? At Oxford High School. How long have you worked at Oxford High School? Since 2015. Can you tell the court what you did prior to that? I was a youth pastor. And how long uh, did you serve as a youth pastor? I was hired in 2009. And can you tell the court um, about your education? Um, I have a master's in counseling through Oakland University. I graduated in 2015. I have an undergrad from Spring Arbor University in 2009, major in youth ministry, minor in psychology. Okay, so you you started at uh, Oxford High School, and your, your current role right now is counselor. Correct. Did you ever serve in any other capacity in Oxford High School? I was an intern in the 2014-2015 school year, in the 2015-2016 school year. I was the international student counselor before taking over a general caseload. Okay, when you say a general caseload, what, what does that include? What are your duties? I have averaged 400 students. Um, I work with them on transitioning into high school, post-secondary transition, scheduling, uh, social-emotional well-being. Uh, it's a myriad of different roles. Okay, when you say scheduling, what does that, what does that in include? As far as helping students with their classes that they are in, um, helping them pick appropriate classes based on their skill set, helping them pick classes that are going to help them in their career after high school. And is that done every year or twice That is done year? once per year. Okay. And you said you had 400 students on your caseload? I have averaged 400 students during my time there, yes. How many students are there at Oxford High School? There is approximately 1,800 students within the building. And how many counselors that are... That do what you do. We have four counselors that have a general caseload, one counselor that has an early college caseload. Okay. I'm sorry, it has what? I need to that. We have four counselors with a general caseload. We have one counselor who has students who are in the early college program. You said you had an average of 400. Correct. Does, does that allow you to actually meet every student on your caseload? The one time I generally get to meet every student is during counseling. If all I were to do is meet with students, I would have approximately two and a half hours per student per year. Um, in addition, though, to the scheduling aspect, what else are you doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, quite a few things. Uh, we have general meetings that we have to do. We have uh, general check-ins. We this year, uh, there's been times we've covered class periods um, with 
with COVID and what does that mean? You've covered class periods where we've we've actually checked in and given time, like during an advisory lesson or something like that, where we're in front of a classroom of students. We do educational development plans with students where we are in the classroom um, with a large group. We have presentations that we do for parents. Um, we have professional development that we need to attend. Okay, what? What circumstances generally give rise to you getting involved with a student that has nothing to do with scheduling but um, might be from a, a teacher or somebody else? Generally, it's a concern for a student's social emotional well being. Um, that there is some concern about a student not being well, um, or that we have a concern that a student might need some additional support that would be beyond the classroom environment. And do you have anything to do with discipline? I do not. Okay. Can you tell the court what last year looked like for your role as a counselor in the, in the high school? Last year was difficult. We at Oxford started in person, um, but we were virtual for about seven weeks during the school year and student attendance was sporadic. Um, Any time a student was either COVID positive or was uh, in close proximity to somebody who was COVID positive, they were quarantined. So it was not a typical school year of, of, of what we would have seen previously. It was an adjustment for the staff. It was an adjustment for the students. It was incredibly difficult. And this year before November 30th, what did the school year, was it more normal or was it back to what you would consider normal? I don't really know what normal would look like at this point from that, but I would say that we were, we were in person with more regularity. We only had two days we were virtual. Uh, they were the two days before Thanksgiving, but um, student attendance was still low in general. Um, we still had we still had students missing school at a higher rate than we had previously seen. Okay, Mr. Hopkins, do you know um, an individual by the name of Ethan Crumbly? Yes. And when did you first meet him? He became on my caseload um, in the fall of 2020. The only memory I have of meeting him during his freshman year would have been when we did scheduling, and I do not remember that meeting specifically because we did them via Zoom. So I had approximately three grades worth of Zoom meetings with students in a three-week period. So you, you meet with all 400 students to schedule every Aside year? Aside from seniors, yes. Okay. Um, when was the next time after freshman year that you had any interaction with with this student? The only interaction I had previous to November 29th was I had received an email from a teacher um, that he seemed sad. Which teacher was that? Diane McConnell, his Spanish teacher. And do you remember approximately what? It would have been early happens. November. Um, and I had just what I would call a check-in. I waited for him outside of the classroom and said, hey, um, I heard you might be having a rough time. I'm here for you if you need to talk. And what did he say? He, he just looked at me, said okay, and did not follow up with anything. Okay. When was the next time you had any interaction with him? The morning of November 29th. And can you tell the court what that was? There was an email sent to our Dean of Students and a Restorative Practices Coordinator that was then forwarded to me. Um, from an English teacher stating that the student had been looking at bullets on his phone in class. So, Go ahead. So the student was called down to the office by a restorative practices coordinator who then called me to ask me to be in the meeting as social emotional support for the student. And did you do that? I did. And do you know approximately what time that was? It was approximately 9 in the morning on the 29th. Okay. Um, about how long did that meeting take place? About five minutes. And what was the student's demeanor? Compliant, calm, understanding. Um, I did not lead the meeting, I was just there in the meeting. 
but the student understood that it was not school appropriate behavior when that was discussed as the reason how do you for know being that? called down. Uh, how, how do you I, know that he understood that? He claimed that he understood that that was not school appropriate behavior. Was he argumentative? No. Was he oppositional? No. Okay. Uh, did you get any other information about that incident? No other information about that incident. Did he have any explanation as to why he was doing what he was doing? He did. He stated that the previous weekend, um, mom and him went to a gun range and went shooting, that it was a hobby that they participated in, and he was researching regarding that hobby. Okay. Before you met with, attended that meeting, did you have any knowledge about his prior history with attendance, grades, behavior? His attendance was good. He had missed one day of school um, during sophomore year. He was on track for graduation, had no behavior incidents reported at school. Does the school uh, document behavioral incidents? They do. How do they do that? Uh, through log entries in our student information system. Okay, and who has access to that information system? Administration, uh, counselors, dean, uh, anybody with administrative access through our information system. Okay. And as a result of that meeting, what, if anything, occurred? Our restorative practices coordinator called home um, to leave a voicemail. Were you there when she left the voicemail? I was. Okay. And that, um, that voicemail's already been entered into evidence. I believe it's exhibit <clears throat> nine. Um, and at some point, was he allowed to go back to the class? He was. All right. And did you, was, was that, did that meeting end in, in a, a negative way or a positive way? It was not a negative way. I would say it was more positive as in the student was understanding of the appropriateness of school behavior based on their response. Um, and there was no, there was no necessary follow through after the meeting. At that time, did you have any knowledge of, um, was there an um, individual education plan for this student? I had no knowledge of one. Okay, and was there, did you have any knowledge of any issues that were going on at home? No. Did you have any reports of um, him being bullied? No. When was the next time you had any interaction with this student? The morning of November 30th. And how did that occur? I had received an email from a co-teacher in that English class stating that he was looking at a video on his phone. Um, the video was of some sort of shooting. It was said in the email that it was not an actual event. When I met with the student, it was described as a video game. Okay, we'll I get know. there in a moment. What, what, about what time was that email? That email was sent to me at 8.30, I saw it at 8.50. Okay, and anything else occur after that? Yes, um, around the same time the student had switched classes and was in his math class. Um, that was when there was drawings done on his math assignment. When was the first time that you were alerted to this math assignment? Our Dean of Students came to my office around, um, around 9 a.m. Uh, to, to let me know that he had received a picture, um, actually had been shown a picture of a math assignment. And did you see it at that time? I had not seen the assignment at that time. Okay, what if anything did you do next? I went to the classroom to get him out of the classroom um, to have a meeting with him. And when you um, greeted him, what was, how would you describe his demeanor? I didn't see much of a demeanor at the time. Okay. He was sitting in the front row of the classroom. Um, so I just said, hey, we, we need to talk. Okay, and what did you do after that? I was standing with him. He stood up and followed me out of the class. I had grabbed the math assignment off his desk. Okay, and you took him Back to your office? Back to my office, okay. where the Dean of Students was waiting. All right. And tell, tell the court what happened in that meeting. 
we had a conversation um, regarding initially the email that I had received about the, the video. So when you're talking about we had a conversation, you're talking about you and Stephen Brumley? Correct. Um, so I had a conversation about the video to ask what it was um, because the email was not overly descriptive as to what it was. Um, and that's when he told me that it was of a video game. I never saw the video, so I had a description of it being a video game per the student and not an actual event per the teacher who had referred it. Okay, so at the time that you brought the student into the room and had the meeting with him, you knew about the email and you had heard about this math assignment. Correct. And you had it in your hand. Correct. What was the purpose of bringing him into the office? Was it a, a violation of a school code? What, what was your role and why did you meet with him? At the time, I did not know whether there was a violation of a school code or not based on having not observed the drawing at the time. I did have concern about the student because it was it was a couple of messages in a couple of days and the purpose of the meeting was to find out what our next steps would be. And when you said you had concern, what was your concern? My concern was that I wanted to make sure he was okay. Okay. So what happened that, what happened after he sat down? What did you tell him you, he was there for? That we had to discuss an email I had received and also we had to discuss his math assignment. Okay. And how did that go? At first, he was very similar to how he had been the previous day, compliant and understanding. Um, with the email, he regarded it as a video game, stated that he had an interest in designing video games after high school. Um, then I put the math assignment in between the two of us. He sat across from me at my desk and I said, I would like to go over some of this. He said that it was a video game drawing that he had done in relation to the pictures that were on the assignment. At that time, there were two versions of that math assignment. Correct. Okay. Which version did you have? I had the hard copy version, which had been doctored. Okay. And that's exhibit... Had been doctored? Had been Yeah, doctored. I'm going to show it, Your Honor. That's exhibit 78. <laughs> Mr. Hopkins, is this what you saw at, at that time of the meeting? Yes. Okay. And you asked him about this Exhibit 78? I did. And what was his answer? His answer was initially that it was a drawing of a video game he wanted to design. I then asked him to explain some of the words that had been written on the drawing. Like what? Um, one that I could read was, my life is useless. Um, and so I, I wanted to ask, what does this mean? This does not sound like a video game. Okay. What, what did he say? His demeanor then changed. He became sad. And when you say he became sad, what did that look like? What do you, what do you he, think he was sad? He started, he started pausing more in his speech. He then described some things that had happened recently in his life. Um, what were those things? He, he talked about how a family dog had died. Um, he talked about that he had lost a grandparent, that COVID had been incredibly difficult for him, um, that being out of school the previous year had been difficult um, for those virtual days. Um, he talked about a friend who had, who had left um, that wasn't able to attend school anymore, was, had moved. Um, and he, he talked about an argument about grades a previous night with parents. With what? With his parents. Okay. What did you do next? At that point, I determined that there was enough suicidal ideation um, based on his sadness and based on some of the words he had written on there that I called mom. When did you see the other version of this worksheet, the original, which is Exhibit 7? Can you put that up on the screen? 
Uh, the original was forwarded to me in an email, and I saw it approximately 20 minutes later. Okay, was it this later? After seeing the original. Was it before you called parents or after? I don't remember. Okay. Um, let's talk about, you just, you said you were concerned about suicide ideation. I was. Okay. What, can you tell the court what you consider and what you learned in your field is suicide ideation? Suicidal ideation are thoughts, patterns, behaviors, feelings associated with suicide. Sadness, depression, um, negative self-talk, all of those themes that we see associated with suicide. Is that the same thing as active? It is uh, not. Actively suicidal. What it is, is the not. Difference? Actively suicidal would contain a plan, a method, a date, action statements, something that he could take action on. And how do you determine if it's ideation versus being actively suicidal? Some of it is taking the information that you have in front of you. I also asked Ethan if he was a threat to himself or others. So is this part of, you, you did a risk assessment? Correct. Okay, what is a risk assessment? A risk assessment is looking to gain information on how the person in front of you is and what level of either suicide risk or self-harm risk they may display. How, I, I know this social emotional uh, duty is part of your job, but how often are you encountering a student that is either has suicidal ideation or actively suicidal? As it has become much more frequent, um, especially in the past year. Um, this year on my caseload, I've had three students make attempts. You've had what? I've had three students make attempts. Okay. And did that occur? Did you speak with, did this Emily, similar assessments with those students or you found out after? It's been different for each one. One, I did have a, a very similar assessment. Okay. Sir, can you do me a favor move a little bit closer? Your voice is kind of trailing at the end. So it does trail at the end. All right. Uh, how many of the these check-ins like the one you did with this student are, are you doing? Is this a frequent thing? Is this abnormal? Is it unusual? It's becoming more common um, lately. I would state that it happens minimal um, once or twice per month okay. um, in just a, a normal school year. All right. And, and every one of those meetings, do you end up calling parents? I do. And what, what triggers a call to a parent? When the student is a minor, yes. When I have concerns about, oh, that's my my statement. When oh. the student is a minor, um, when I have concerns that there needs to be follow up mental health support for a student, um, when I have concerns that the student may potentially become um, suicidal. Okay. So at some point you said you did call a parent, and who I did. did. You, who did you call? I called mom. Why did you call mom? I always give students the choice of who they would like me to call. Um, the student stated that mom would be easier to get a hold of. What was his reaction or demeanor about you calling a parent? He was very muted at that point. Almost, I would describe it as like resigned to the fact that I was going to call home. Did he object? No. Did he ask you not to? No. Okay. Did you get a hold of mom? I left a voicemail with mom. And did she call you back? She did eventually. In between the call back, I also called dad. Um, I don't know whether the phone was answered or not. It was empty air when okay. I called. You did eventually speak to mom. I did. And when you spoke to her, was uh, Ethan in the room? He was. Was was the phone on speaker or was it just you talking? I put the phone on speaker. Okay. And what did, um, it, by the way, do you see her anywhere in the courtroom today? I haven't looked. Could you look, please? Do you see, do you see, it's Jennifer Crumbly, correct? Do you correct. see her in the courtroom today? Correct. Can you describe what she's wearing? Uh, I can just see her face. She has a gray mask, glasses. All right. Uh, 
Your Honor. You might have to step aside a little bit. Can you describe an article of clothing that she's wearing? Can I stand? Sure. sure. Uh, gray stripes with white stripes on the shirt. May the record look like he's properly identified. Okay, thank you. What did uh, Jennifer Crumbly say on speakerphone? Um, she wanted to talk to Ethan and ask what was going on. Um, he gave a response of, I don't know, um, was, was kind of his response. What did you tell mom? I stated that I was concerned about Ethan based on some of the time I'd had speaking with him and based on the assignment and information I had. I then sent a photo of exhibit, is it 78? The, the second version? The second, yes. The, the second version to mom. Okay, and did mom eventually have exhibit seven? Uh, yes, that was forwarded in an email. Okay, and what, what did you ask mom to do, if anything? I asked her to please come to the school. And what did she say? Uh, she stated that she was at work and that she would try and get in touch with the dad. Okay, and then what was your response? I stated that I had tried calling dad and was unable to get a hold of him. And what happened next? We ended the phone call with her attempting to get a hold of dad. And eventually, did you have another conversation with I Jennifer did. Crumbly? I did. She called one more time to state that she was also unable to get a hold of dad, um, that she would be there, but it would be approximately a half hour. Okay. So did you, was it your impression that she wanted dad to come because she couldn't come or that she wanted both of them to come? What did she say? My impression was that she was hoping that dad would be able to come because she wouldn't be able to come. Okay. But eventually... She said she was coming. Correct. Okay. And who eventually showed up at the school? Both mom and dad. How long approximately did that take? Do you know what time that they... That they arrived? Yes. It was, I, I believe, around 1030. Okay. So you, in the meantime, where was uh, Ethan? He was with me. I didn't want to leave him alone. Okay. What were you, what, what were you doing? We had uh, further conversations um, about some plans for him after high school. Typically, when a student is waiting for parents to arrive, it's a nerve-wracking time for the student, and I don't want them to be focused on that moment if I can help it. Backing up just a little bit about the risk assessment, when did you... Uh, conduct that with Ethan? It was prior to calling mom. And what kinds of things did you ask him? I asked him if he was a threat to himself or others. Um, and his statement back to me was, I can see why this looks bad. I'm not going to do anything. I then asked him to describe some of the words and pictures that he had written on the, on the sheets. And what did he say? He stated that the pictures were a video game um, but when I asked him to go deeper into the words, he, he continued to display the sadness um, that we had discussed earlier of the, the friend um, not being able to attend school, um, dog dying, a grandparent dying. Um, did you, when he said, I can see how this looks bad, I'm not going to do anything, did you stop there or did you ask him any more questions? I asked him specific questions about what he had written. I did okay. not ask any further questions about a plan. Okay. And why not? Because he stated that he was not a threat to himself or others. Okay. When mom and dad arrived, can you, well, let's back up. How many times approximately a year do you have a situation where you're concerned about a student's mental health and their safety and you call parents in? 12 to 15 per year. Okay. Um, and can you tell the court what happened when they arrived? Did you go get them or did somebody else? I went to go get them in the counseling office lobby. And who else was uh, in that meeting? Uh, the student was in that meeting and then I also texted our dean to return for that meeting. Okay, so who arrived first, the dean or the parents? The parents. Okay, and um, what? where were you uh, when the parents entered the room? Were you in front of them or behind them? 
I was in front of them. Okay. And what, what, what happened when they walked in the room? It was different than other meetings I've seen. Like Why that. is that? They weren't friendly or showing care to their student. Did they, to their son? To their son. Did they greet him? No. Did they touch him? No. Did they hug him? No. Where did uh, Jennifer Crumbly sit? Uh, I have three seats in my office that are not mine. Um, two directly across from me and one that's more off to the side. Um, so you're at a desk? I'm at a desk. You're um, behind the desk and there's two There would be front. two seats across from me and then one that would not be far from where um, our judge is sitting. So about how many feet? I would say about seven feet from me. Okay. Where did Jennifer Crumbly sit? In the seat uh, further away. And where did uh, James Crumbly sit? Next to Ethan. And what happened next? I described why I was concerned about Ethan. Um, that he had stated that he was not a threat to himself, but I had concerns about suicidal ideation, and I had concerns about his well-being. I provided a list of resources. Of well, let's back up for a second. Did Mom, did Jennifer or James ask any questions about what suicide ideation is? Not to my memory. Okay. Did they ask any questions at all before you talked about any mental health services? Not to my memory. Okay. Um, did you ask them for any input or did you ask them any questions? Uh, not, not at that point. Okay. So what happened? So I provided a list of resources of, of mental health supports and stated that uh, though Ethan doesn't, um, though he, he states he's not a threat, that I am concerned about his well-being and that I am concerned that he needs somebody to talk to for mental health support. And did you tell either one of them when that should occur? I said as soon as possible, today if possible. And what was the response? That today was not an option because they had to return to work. My response Just was- Just slow down for a second. Did both of them say that? Did one of them say that? Mom said that. Okay, and her exact words were what? Today is not possible. We have to return to work. And what did James Crumbly say? I don't remember anything being said by him about it. Did he say that he had to return to work? Objection, Your Honor. The witness stated he doesn't know what James says. Well, I'll rephrase. rephrase. With regard to not being able to take Ethan that day, did James Crumbly ever say anything or object to what Jennifer Crumbly said? He did not object to anything that Mom said. Okay. And so, has that ever happened before? I, relevance, it's relevancy. The relevancy is, uh, I have to show that defendants were grossly negligent and did not um, have ordinary care or apply ordinary care. And whether or not this professional who has at least 12 to 13 meetings a year like this and asks parents to take this child, their, their son, for treatment or take them home, I think it's absolutely reasonable because, um, reasonable because it's my standard is an ordinary care. Go ahead. In any of your meetings, when you call parents because you have that kind of concern, has have you ever had anybody say no? I have never had parents arrive to the school and not take their student home. If you ask, if you tell them they need to. Correct. Okay. So what did you do? I was a little bit taken aback by that. Um, when when parents uh, stated that they could not um, take their student home that day, my statement was, I want him seen within 48 hours. I'll be following up. Okay. Did you ask them to take him home or did you ask them to take him to get? I asked them to take him to get therapy. Okay. And what was the response when you said follow up, you're going to follow up and it needed to happen in 48 hours? I would describe it as compliant of okay. I didn't have a reason to believe it wouldn't happen. I didn't feel 100% confident that it would happen. 
And what was your primary concern at that moment? My primary concern was that Ethan would not be alone. And why didn't you want him to be alone? Because suicidal ideation, I don't want a student left alone. Okay. Did this, the demeanor or lack of conversation or interaction with him by James and Jennifer, did it seem to have any impact on him? Not different than I had seen previously with a generalized sadness. I would describe that was how he stayed throughout most of the meeting. His demeanor did not shift. Okay. Did, in the entire, how long did the meeting last? Less than 15 minutes. In the entire meeting, did Jennifer Crumbly say anything to her son? I don't remember her saying anything to her son. Did James Crumbly say anything to his son? Okay, this guidance counselor there on the stand in court today in Oakland County being questioned by the Oakland County prosecutor uh, uh, about what uh, his conversations were like with Ethan Crumbly. Uh, of course, that was the headline today, a judge ruling that the Crumbly parents, Jennifer and James, will indeed uh, stand trial for involuntary manslaughter. They're facing four charges each of involuntary manslaughter. The prosecutors uh, are accusing both parents of failing to act when their son showed mental distress and created disturbing drawings before he opened fire on classmates at Oxford High School last November the 30th, killing four other students, wounding several others, so we uh, are going to continue to follow this story. We have been on top of this story ever since it broke. I'm Andrew Kraft. Thanks for being with us here.